I'm Rob McRae. I'm head of the WLSA, and um, we're a global association uh, focused on bringing together kind of the most committed organizations and people and thought leaders to advance connected health. Uh, one of our um, affiliates and association uh, members is uh, Continual Health Alliance. So I'm here and very pleased to um, to oversee and uh, manage this conversation. Um, there are no slides, and uh, you can hold the applause, but that's, that's the only slide you're going to have. You'll, you'll see plenty of them over the next couple of days. Um, and um, the slide um, describes the, um, the individuals and uh, the organization uh, they're from. Um, so I just kind of, I just want to frame and maybe find out what the audience is, and we'll get right into it, because it's the end of the day. Um, we don't have cookies, we don't have wine, we don't have beer, um, and, um, and uh, it's, it's great to have so many of you here. I, I appreciate that. So um, first, I just kind of show of hands quickly, how many um, health care providers do we have in the room? Uh, researchers, technology folks, companies? Consumers, consumer-oriented, we're all consumers, but other than our, but anyone from that perspective specifically? Okay. Um, consumers, patients. How, uh, how many of you know what Continua Health Alliance is? All right. So, wow. there we go. I can just go okay. <laughs> all right. Um, so, um, you know, hopefully we'll fix that. So, the, the format here is, um, that we'll, we'll have a conversation. Uh, you'll hear some, some opening comments from each of our panelists. And uh, then we'll have some dialogue. I have some questions and we'll have some dialogue among us. We want to keep this conversational. But be thinking about what your questions are because we have plenty of time. And, um, you know, after we get through making some points, we, we want to, we have two mics here and we hope that. Uh, that uh, those are well used and that we get your questions. Um, there's a lot of diversity in the room, and uh, so I think uh, we all look at ourselves as a resource uh, to, um, to make this a productive use of your time. Um, so um, with that, we, we're going to start, and I'm going to be popping up and down because we're one mic short, I guess, on this table. Um, and, um, but Chris Wasden um, from PwC is going to uh, start us off. When we talk about interoperability, I sometimes get the feeling people think that interoperability is some sort of a, a, a virtue, like courage or love or, or uh, temperance or prudence or something like that. And as a result of that, I think when people think of it as a virtue, they often think that maybe it doesn't actually create value in and of itself. Okay. Better? All right. Um, and so when we deal with our commercial customers, which is what we have because they pay us money, uh, they're often asking us, well, what is the value of interoperability? Can you actually quantify it for me? So as we've looked at this and tried to answer that question, we've said, well, you know, we understand that in the healthcare system, the Institute of Medicine has said there's $700 billion worth of waste. And others have done their own estimates, and they all come out around the same number. And they've identified where that waste comes from. And so we've said, well, if we were to look at that as the waste number, how much of that is really associated with interoperability? So we've done some analysis of that. And we've actually determined that probably about 8% of that $700 billion, roughly around $50 billion, is, is waste associated just with the lack of interoperability. So interoperability on an annual basis does have a cost, or the lack of interoperability has a cost that can be quantified. Now the question comes up with regards to whose cost is it? So presumably those that experience or bear most the cost should care the most about trying to eliminate that cost. And when we first looked at interoperability, and I'm talking about just interoperability of medical devices, all right? So we looked at interoperability we said, well, really, who accrues the benefit of it? We found to our surprise that almost none of the value accrues to medical device companies. Okay? The companies that actually could enable interoperability of medical devices accrue almost no value from it. In fact, their business models run counter to it. They like closed systems that are interoperable because that kind of creates a closed garden 
that, that keeps their systems proprietary. We then said, well, you know, payers pay all these bills. Maybe there's some value to payers. And we found that actually there's only a couple percent of the total really accrues to payers. Almost all the value in interoperable medical devices accrues to providers. Yet how many providers are focused on trying to get their piece of that $50 billion to decrease the cost of the healthcare system? And how many providers are really putting leverage or, or force or energy behind that to get medical device companies to create interoperable medical devices? And unfortunately, the answer is like none. Now, we have a provider on our, our panel here. He can address what he's doing. But the, the challenge is, as we look at interoperable medical devices, we can see that there's tremendous value. And when I talk about this, this value that I've quantified, okay, which is an economic value, I've not talked at all about lives that are saved or pain that's removed from the system. Those are all things that have not been quantified and added to that. So when we look at all the different sources of value beyond economic, there's also rationale or justification to create interoperability, but yet we haven't seen enough driving towards grabbing this value. And so what we're going to talk about on the panel is different initiatives going on in order to create the standards and protocols and guidelines and practices of, of healthcare in order to go after that value to create that savings and as well as improvement in quality of life among people. So I am going to be jumping up. So let me just emphasize a couple of things. So in case anyone missed it, the IOM report that Chris referenced came out about a month ago, $750 billion per year in U.S. healthcare spending, that's sort of the insured and reimbursed part of spending, in waste per year. That is as much as, remember that presidential election we just had? and the candidates were arguing over $716 billion coming out of Medicare, that was a 10-year number. This is $750 billion a year, $50 billion of that related to waste because of uh, the lack of interoperability. And I think what you're saying, if I put my words on it, not yours because I don't work for those companies, uh, the winners are medical device companies and the losers are health care providers and presumably patients and taxpayers. Don't, you don't if, have to agree, but if, I think, that, if, I think if the, that's... If you mean the winners are those that are... Uh, benefiting from a lack of interoperability, and the losers are those who are not benefiting from interoperability. Right? That would be it. Right? That would be it. Okay, so um, uh, next um, we have Anthony Delacoli from Elvis Networks, who's also um, um, a, um, I can't remember your office of position, with Continue it, it, it itself, so um, he'll cover a couple of points for us. Great, thank you. Uh, full disclosure, so I run a software company in the Boston area called Elbers Networks. We are a small software integrator that really helps big platforms to bring interoperable data um, to their systems. And ultimately, you know, what Chris is speaking to and what our two health providers will, will speak to to my right are that these systems um, really drive consumers of data that expect all sorts of things from their data, both from regulated or meaningful use applications to unregulated and consumer-centric uses to that application. Um, the granularity in which you have to collect that data, make it interoperable from a point of collection, uh, from a point of definition as it goes through the value chain of where it gets consumed, um, needs standardization and more importantly needs certification. Now one of my, for everybody who's ever heard me speak before, one of my opening lines is um, that Continua is the world's best kept secret. It's not relevant in this room because half the room raised their hands when they said if they knew what Continua was. Uh, I'd love to turn that around later on in the presentation and figure out what you thought was Continua before today's presentation, but at the highest level we have 250, and I, I run a work group at Continua, really focused on market outreach and driving adoption of Continua standards across the ecosystem. At the end of the day, we have a six-year-old trade association that I do believe is the world's best kept secret, and we have been expanding beyond the borders of U.S. and North America to China and India, where we have work groups up and running, and Japan, where we have work groups up and running, and uh, hopefully in the, by this time next year we'll talk about a, a work group up and running in South America as well. But 250 member companies, and I, and I call the board of Continua, Chris was a board member for some time, as a contentious one. And I mean that in a very good way, because we have the value chain of players that can make a difference, from device manufacturers to payers to providers to technology companies who are vested in driving, at the end of the day, what is disruption in bringing interoperable data into the healthcare field. Um, three, u three core usage cases that we drive, and these are usual suspects to everybody in this room, but really focused on wellness and fitness is one core usage case. 
A second one, really around living independently. I think we have uh, maybe a number of baby boomers in the room, a number outside this room that really believe it drives the ordinary amount of uh, cost, at least in the U.S. systems. And, and three, one where the money is today, and probably the, the, the most difficult to, to crack from a regulatory perspective is the disease management states. Uh, and bringing interoperable health data from device all the way through a system and be able to certify those systems becomes the core charter to continue on. So as the world's best kept secret in healthcare, our job is not to produce standards, we consume standards. And what I mean by that is that we rely on third party organizations, whether that's HL7, whether that's the IEEE, to drive standards around data interoperability and around device interoperability, where we then certify um, in, in, in our testing uh, procedures and in the and fundamentally in the brand that is Continua. So as we talk today, um, you'll hear me over and over again try to exude the fact that, again, we're talking about systems level interoperability where we have to talk about where the costs are. What Chris described is a cost structure that doesn't take place on the front end where the devices are, but really on the back end on how that data gets integrated back into core systems where people are driving usages of that data. And again, to my right, we really have two examples of health organizations that drive usage of that data at a very granular level that will start opening up our eyes and, and hopefully um, um, our, our imaginations to how, why interoperability isn't really a choice. It is the baseline to actually start engaging and scaling fundamentally pre preventative healthcare data in the industry. So I'll stop there and we'll keep going. Let me, before, before you do, um, just give because we had half people that really didn't know Continua, so they probably couldn't tell, um, about, tell you about what devices, what companies already have um, devices that are Continual compliance. Just give some examples. All right. So again, we have um, devices that get certified on the systems. Um, everybody from Omron to A and D, which are building personal care devices that have been certified um, across a range of device classifications. Whether that's a weight scale, whether that's a blood pressure cuff, um, uh, have been certified to um, two standards really. One is around the transport and how those devices connect to the network whether that's over a Bluetooth uh, uh, transport, whether that's over a Zigbee transport. Um, and secondly, there's how that device actually produces data and how that data is gonna be legible, if you think about this, in systems that data is gonna be consumed. Um, and we certify that data uh, across an interface we call the WAN interface, which fundamentally uh, leverages a piece of technology that comes out of the IEEE that at a device classification by device classification, we are standardizing syntax to how data gets consumed. Um, and that's where things get really interesting, where large platforms, we have two large platforms here at the, um, at the conference in Qualcomm Life. Everybody familiar with Qualcomm Life, right? Um, and Verizon, uh, well, let's call them large sort of data platforms that are bringing this level of interoperability and how they're bringing data into their systems and driving the data syntax to uh, health interoperability that's anchored in uh, what Continua is trying to establish. So I'm going to take it really simple here, um, just to make sure we're all on the same page before we go on and talk with the rest of the conversation. Um, so the notion is that you should be able to go buy, or if you're on the clinical side, recommend or prescribe an activity monitor, any kind of vital signs monitor for use in your home, in your office, in and around your car, your person, um, wherever you are outside of the clinic, and have the data that is collected from you by that device delivered seamlessly through uh, a platform. And Continua doesn't provide the platform, other companies will, but have it actually work together so that you can collect information from a variety of different sensors. You take that choice out of it so that we, if, for those of you from healthcare, would understand, so the goal is to end up, is to not end up like our healthcare IT system, where we have siloed IT systems that don't want to talk to each other um, and kind of force providers, customers to work within one silo or another. So that's the core mission of Continua. So let me ask a question. Based on, so this concept of interoperability comes out of that. We want these devices, the information to be interoperable, shareable, so that the end user 
the consumer, the co whether it's an institution or an individual, can use it without having to have a degree in information technology. So is there anyone here that thinks that interoperability is not a value that we want to achieve? Is that, is that, we all agree, that's what we want. So I think the rest of the discussion, we have two, two um, provider systems um, represented. So starting with them and then kind of the rest of the discussion, I think we can talk about what can we do with it. There are challenges and all that, and then as I say, get, get to your questions. So Rob Havasi is from Partners Healthcare in Boston, obviously one of the preeminent organizations um, in, in healthcare, in traditional healthcare, but um, back in 1995, um, Dr. Joe Kvedar, there, a good friend of ours, created the Center for Connected Health. And um, so Rob comes out of, out of that organization, which serves partners and uh, now others. Rob? Uh, thanks. So it's not unusual to have a, a panel I was with providers down on one end and other people on the other. <laughs> Normally they do this between providers and payers, just probably so we don't start strangling each other in the middle of a conversation. But um, in this case, it was just a happy accident of the way we ended up here, so don't read anything into it. Uh, as Rob said, I, I represent Partners Healthcare, and we may be one of the preeminent providers um, in the nation right now, or at least we'd like to think so. But as we heard a little bit earlier, we're also some big losers in this system. And over the last 10 years or so, as we've worked towards building out our vision of connected health, uh, which includes what we would call mHealth, um, we've discovered along the way that uh, we think Chris is, and Price Waterhouse is absolutely right in some of their analysis. Right? We are big losers today, and the costs of devices that do not interoperate well are astronomical for us. And they divert a tremendous number of resources away from other things that we would like to be doing, such as providing health care and furthering our charitable missions, et cetera. Over the last probably 18 months, we at the Center for Connected Health have embarked on a, a large project to close what I consider the, the last sort of mile of the interoperability of these systems, and that is finally getting the data we collect from outside of our network into an electronic medical record system, which, based on many of the business plans and models that I see from companies around here, seems to be the end of most people's strategy. Well, you can do this, you can collect that, and you can share it with your provider. And nothing really goes beyond that. And if nothing else, if you take nothing else away from my remarks here today, I would like to say that that is most certainly not the end of this chain. In fact, for us, it is just the beginning. We put data in the electronic medical record not because it's a convenient place to put it, right, as Oracle or SAP or any number of other people would tell you there are many, many databases I could use to house information that I collect. We put it in our medical record because that's the system our clinicians use when they treat patients. And ultimately, that's what we're trying to do. I put that data in an electronic medical record because that's what my clinicians use, most of them. If they use something else, that's where the data needs to go. And so the most important point from the remarks that came before me, particularly something Anthony said, really, really resonates, that the scope of this interoperability includes not just devices. We're not here just to beg manufacturers to please make things that are easier to plug together, right? But the data that comes out of them needs to be able to move around and needs to go wherever it needs to go. And this conference is ultimately about technology and the way that people interact with technology and the use of technology to, in most cases, fundamentally change behavior. Right? We're putting mHealth technology in the hands of consumers and patients and asking them to use it to alter things about their lifestyle which will lead to better health outcomes and better health for everyone. At the same time, I as a provider am asking my providers to be part of that. Right? This is not just about empowering consumers to go it alone. This is about enabling a conversation between patients and providers to achieve better outcomes for all, hopefully at a lower cost. And so I need to move that data around once I receive it from their devices. And I say your devices because many of you raised your hand when we asked what you do as, as being manufacturers. We need to move that data around to a variety of places, medical records here, medical records there. Different systems need to share that data to coordinate care. And the coordination of care 
is an area that was, has been sorely overlooked and is certainly in the news today as, as something we need to get much better at if we want to wring the rest of the costs out, this system, out of this system. So if I've learned nothing else over the last 18 months of trying to get this data into the medical record, it is that there's a long way yet to go when it comes to data interoperability. And we really need some help from all of the players in the industry to get there. Winners, losers, everybody else. In order to make, to turn this data into information and ultimately into the knowledge we need to affect decision making for both consumers and payers, we really need a free flow of this information from place to place. And fundamentally that is the core of what we've done. At the end of the day, I think the idea of system level interoperability is really the key. Right? This is not just about plugging devices in. Speech coaches and people who, who prepare you to, to speak at events like this tell you to find a, something relevant, right? Something that just happened that we all know about. And we probably haven't seen a better demonstration of device level interoperability than what happened in the back when we were all waiting for this to start, right? Those guys swapped out a camera and a bunch of components on that video system in a matter of minutes because everything plugs into everything else and all the tapes are standard formats and all the connectors are standard formats and that device level interoperability works very well but that does not at all guarantee that the video they're making is going to be compelling or useful for people. And it's the same thing here in, in medicine, right? I can plug together all the home monitoring devices I can find and I can deluge my system with more data than we can possibly analyze. But unless I can move that data to the places it needs to go and the formats it needs to be to satisfy the constituencies, all of the different constituencies, we really haven't accomplished anything other than creating very big databases without a lot of knowledge derived from them. So I'll close this with a, a simple example from our current learnings. At the Center for Connected Health, we run a number of programs inside a very large integrated delivery network. We collect data for home glucose monitoring and home blood pressure monitoring and different parameters for congestive heart failure and weight and activity and you name it. And when people come to me and say, I have a solution for your diabetes, right, for a diabetes home monitoring program, you can get the data and you can share it with your clinicians. My request or my question back is always, okay, which clinicians? And what diabetes? because the needs of a type 1 diabetic who's lived with a condition since they were a child and probably knows more about their own response to food and insulin than their endocrinologist ever will are dramatically different than a 70 year old person with limited English capacity who was just told yesterday that they're 50 pounds overweight and has type 2 diabetes and yet it's all diabetes. And when you ask me what the clinicians need my answer is okay which clinicians because between those two spectrums we may have endocrinologists, we have diabetes educators, we have nutritionists, we have dietitians, we have primary care physicians and a host of people in between all of whom would like to see that data differently and all of whom would like to see that in whatever systems they happen to use on a daily basis. And so unless that data is truly interoperable and transportable, unless I can move that data and turn it into information in all of those different interfaces Again, we've really accomplished nothing more than shoving a bunch of things into a big database. And so if, if there's anything I can ask for today and that I hope our discussions will help lead to today on the clinical side, and I know Hank's going to talk a little bit more about this on the patient side, it is that. That interoperability is not stop at the EMR and it is really truly system interoperability that we're talking about. Thank you. So, um, thanks. Before we, before we get to Hank, Rob, can you, um, I mean, you have started to incorporate information from remote monitoring devices, vital science monitors, into the partner's EHR. Can you just give everyone a concrete example, just and talk about the benefits of it from a clinical perspective? Well, ever since we turned this integration on, I've been pretty much out of work and partying, so I don't know uh, how many. <laughs> It was a long road if anybody's ever done anything inside a core electronic medical record system, especially a homegrown one. But um, the value for us is, is this, and, and it is to complete what we consider the connected health nirvana, right, which is a truly a conversation among equals between patients and providers and an ability to coordinate care. So when I say we put data into the EHR, what I really mean, so translate this in your minds, we make data accessible through our electronic health record. It still resides in my database. I control the graphs and the charts and the, the way it's displayed. 
But any clinician in my system, wherever they happen to be, from the emergency room to the primary care facility to a community clinic to the core hospital, can call up a patient record, see, oh, they have some remote monitoring data for whatever the condition is, click a button, and see it, ideally in a format that's related to how they want to see it. And what that enables, because I've also done that for our patient portal, what that enables is a true conversation. A patient can walk into the provider's office, and instead of having to pull out their own iPad and show a provider something they've never seen before, they can say, oh, well, I noticed my blood glucose has been going up over the last few weeks, and I'm telling you, I'm trying with my diet, I'm really trying to be better, and I don't understand why it's happening. And the provider can call it up, and it looks the same. And in that primary care office, they can say, okay, here's what I see when I look at this. What were you doing here? What were you doing here? And it really enables that conversation. There are benefits far beyond that that we envision, but right now, that's really what's happening. It's beginning to enable that conversation at all levels. And whether it's a, one of our clinical pharmacists helping a patient work with their medication or a primary care physician helping them with some lifestyle choices or an endocrinologist helping that same patient with some more complex issues surrounding their condition, having that same data set available to them at whatever system they happen to be looking at really begins to enable those conversations to coordinate that care. Okay, thanks. That's excellent. So. Um Hank Vanberg is here from Christus Health, and, and I guess I'm going to recharacterize a little bit of what Rob just said, because I think that what we're looking for is a situation where the clinician, the doctor, can basically say, I want to know blank, and have the answers in the EHR the next time he, she has an encounter with the patient, and make it easy to do so. But um, Hank, you're, you're going to bring us to the real world, I hope. Well, ho hopefully. Thanks, Rob. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I was reminded, I was having a flashback listening to everybody else. I'm old enough to have uh, been in college during the Vietnam War era. So I'm sitting here at this chant going through my head, free the data, free the data. And, and really that's ultimately in the bottom line what it's really all about. When we talk about interoperability, I think we also need to, to think about process interoperability. And, and what do I mean by that? There are probably some standard definitions of that. I'm not an engineer, so don't ask me about engineering types of, of definitions. But from a patient perspective, so we've started to send patients home postoperatively with some devices where we can monitor them at home, take some vital sign monitoring. And those of you that have been in, in the industry long enough to watch the development of home monitoring, you know, once upon a time, there were devices that were very specific. You'd plug them into your, you know, your, your POTS line uh, before the days of, of cellular availability, and you had to have a special device, and you know, maybe you could do something if you happened to have Internet in the home, but you, you had this device that was single purpose, and people had to input data, do different things to it. Well, if you take a look down in the exhibit hall here, We've, we, we've changed dramatically. So the cell phone is now a, a hub that can be used in the home to collect information from any number of different devices, scales, blood pressure cuffs, pulse oximeters, or the tablet. You know, we have tablets that can do the same thing, and these could be wired, they could be wireless, whatever. But the point of that is, as a provider, what I want to be able to do is to go to a person that we are discharging from the hospital, or maybe they have a chronic disease, and I want to be able to say to them, go to your drugstore, pick up a scale, and as long as if you see that continuous certification on it, it'll work, plug and play. I don't have to want to send some type of field service technologist out to someone's home to set up the device for them to make sure that the blood pressure cuff is going to connect to the hub that's going to send the data to the care team because that's expensive, it's inconvenient for everybody, and you know, maybe the device will work, maybe it won't. So one of the benefits that we're looking for in terms of driving convenience for the individual, driving down costs, creating efficiency, is the interoperability of the device where the individual doesn't have to worry about anything, just go look for the seal, we know it's going to work. And, and it solves a lot of problems, a lot of time. Uh, and, and you would be surprised, the, little, the issues. You send home 
an 85-year-old female living alone with a tablet that she's never seen before, you'll get real interesting questions like, how do I turn it on? We've had these questions. This is reality. Not all of them are like that, but someone that's never had that experience before, they want to use it, they're willing to use it, but you need to show them how to use it. So we need to make it as fail-safe for that individual. So think about the individual. Think about the end user and what they need to have that experience. The other piece we need to think about is the data and letting that individual have access to that data. You know, as provider organizations, we're real, we, we really want to make sure the providers have that data. We want to make sure that it flows to where it needs to flow, whether it's the EMR, whatever workflow. And those of you that are in the vendor side of things, if you haven't checked out workflow, the process around how a provider, how a doctor goes about his or her daily routine, how the care team, the nurses, the care coordinators go around their daily routines, Really take a look at that because it's the workflow which ultimately is going to determine how they use the data. But I haven't seen a lot of focus on that individual. And what about giving them access to the data? It's their data. So we want them to be able to have that data. We want to be able to help educate them and let them see what's happening, see trends. Is their weight staying the same? Is it going down? What's happening with their blood pressure? And we can't do that if the data only goes into one location or my other big bugaboo and is the business model of the companies that are making these applications and you know, the data goes someplace and we'll give you access to it and oh, by the way, it's only going to cost you $30 per patient per month. As a provider, we can't afford to add $30 per patient per month to the cost of care. And that's just for one application. And if I needed two applications or three applications, I have to times that by application. And you know, if you haven't been noticing what's happening out there in terms of reimbursement, you know, it, it, it's not going up. It's coming down. And, and we're still in those conversations to see what's going to happen around reimbursement. So think about the entire ecosystem. Think about the architecture, our enterprise architecture that we have within a health system where these types of applications need to fit. We just can't simply drop them on top of them and that we'll, we're going to be able to use them. They need to fit into our own enterprise architecture. So just to ask when you're designing these types of applications, think about the, the whole end-to-end -end process. Where does the data need to go? Who needs to use the data? How do we get the data into the hands of the patient? How do we make sure that the device they're going to use at home will work without a whole lot of care and concern and worry from them as to whether or not they know how to use it and they're going to be able to use it properly so we can do a better job in making them part of the care team? So with that, I will um, pause and take a breath. Okay, thanks, Hank. Um, so um, two months ago, um, Medicare CMS rules changed for hospital readmissions, and we have the first set of penalties related to uh, things that go on outside of a hospital. Um, I don't think the penalties are large enough, based on what I've heard from honest hospitals, to, to drive much behavior. But um, there certainly are um, leaders that are looking at, the, at this as a necessary part of their future uh, to take more responsibility for what happens at home. So presumably this drives um, desirability and demand and evaluation for uh, interoperable platforms for remote patient monitoring. Um, just maybe starting with our two hospital systems, can you offer any specific examples within the readmissions area or others of where you are using interoperable um, systems? Well, I, I still have the mic, so I'll, 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 I'll start first. So, so yes, yeah, so as I was kind of describing earlier, um, we've started doing this with patients that are being discharged from the hospital, sending them home with these monitoring devices. And what we're able to do, and it's pretty early on, and, and actually sitting in the audience is one of my colleagues, Shannon Clifton, who is our director of community health. And this is really her project, and she's the one who can really tell you all the stories. Um, but we have stories coming in from individuals 
where you know, the, the care team, and it's not necessarily the physician, but we're getting the data, simple, simple, simple little thing like their weight. So someone has been discharged from the hospital, maybe you know, they have, they have you know, COPD, uh, and all of a sudden you see over a very short period of time, three, four, five days, their weight is going up. So instead of you know, waiting around what would normally happen if no one's watching that, sooner or later that person's going to wind up back in the hospital. They're going to show, present to the ED. They'll be readmitted. But this way, we have someone who's getting that data. They could see the trend going up. And real simple, you call the individual and you try to understand what's going on. And in, in one situation, this was you know, this 80-year-old-plus individual whose son was responsible for making sure that she got all of her meds and everything was fine. Her son went on vacation. She didn't know how to renew her medications and had stopped taking her Lasix. Mm -hmm. And in a short period of time, her weight went up. And if that would have continued, that would have developed into a crisis. So by having a home monitoring device, we were able to have the care team see that something was happening, call that person on the phone and find out what was going on and get to the root cause of why they were having that issue and resolve it and, and prevent an uh, a unnecessary readmission. So that's one example that we did. Hey, Rob? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna really key off of something that Hank said earlier and, and that's not to to make it seem that all providers are interchangeable, but to point out to you that we do have very similar problems, right? So these are real and not just the rantings of one lunatic like me. Um, we, uh, we have a heart failure program as well. It's been running for about seven or eight years at Partners Healthcare, very similar to what Hank described for his program. And, and we've seen many anecdotes that work the same way. But I'll tell you right now what I'm struggling with on that program to really drive home one of the points here, and that is scalability. So over the last five or six years, through a variety of measures, we've shown that we can reinduce congestive heart failure readmissions in Massachusetts General Hospital and Brigham and Women's Hospital by 30 to 50 percent, depending on who you ask and how they slice and dice some numbers. Right, so we have no doubt that this idea of connected health works. We wouldn't have named ourselves the Center for Connected Health if we really doubted its power. What I'm having trouble with today is scaling that program in a cost-effective way, even knowing the penalties that we may face um, if, our re if our readmission rates are too high. And what we find is, to Hank's point, many of the costs associated with these devices and programs are in fact barriers to scalability. The costs do not come down the more patients I put on a program. They just simply add and multiply, right? So I dump some capital into getting several hundred of the devices that I use for my congestive heart failure program, and that's fine. But the monthly costs don't change. And in many cases, those monthly costs are being charged to me whether or not the device is in use, because there's a period of the device's life where it comes back. It has to be cleaned. It has to be disinfected and repackaged and get made ready to go back out into the field. And the business models today just simply don't support that. Where the interoperability piece plays into that is is that the cost, the inertia of this program is such that changing the device, finding a device or a company, bringing to me a new and novel business model is almost prohibitive. I think Chris has some better numbers on, on it than this, but just to make a change in the API with which I'd need to integrate to take data from a new type of device where there's no interoperability is going to cost me thousands and thousands of dollars. Right? And so as, as entrance into the market, as new entrance, if you're trying to displace incumbents, right? demonstrating some sort of interoperability is actually a way to do that. Because I know at least if I, you know, bite the swallow that pill now, I'll get myself to a place where I can find the best of breed devices as your new ones come out. But right now, the incentives to scaling are just not there. The costs do not come down the more devices I throw at this and the more people I try and put on. And, uh, I mean, I'll leave it at that, but, but that's really the biggest thing I'd like to to drive home, right? That the costs pile up to change, and that's really the savings that we as providers, that's the big numbers that Chris was talking about. Where we save as providers is the ability to adapt the technology to changing needs of patients and changing needs of providers and pick and choose what we need when we need it without having to incur new integration costs. So now we've gotten to the discouraging part of the conversation. Um, the, the reality. So, I so, so uh, yeah, I think we, we, uh, we, we need to come back to Anthony and, and Chris. Um, and, 
So. You know, what we want in healthcare, I, I guess I've said this, other people have, is to have that wonderful um, metric that, that's occurred in consumer electronics where over time technology gets both better and cheaper. And somehow bringing, you know, those benefits um, a little bit into healthcare and health is, uh, is kind of this larger societal goal. And, and Rob just said, well, we're certainly not there yet, but here we have two fellows that can tell us how to get there. I just wanted to quote, scale is the lesson learned in this room and in, at this conference. Fundamentally, our ability to turn on one of these things and be able to connect to a network, potentially when you're roaming to another network, potentially when you're in a different country, to its network with the same device is the type of scale that we're, we're speaking to. And there's lessons learned with you know, a lot of our carrier friends here that have fundamentally driven innovation on top of standard connectivity. Right? And, and, and that's when we, when we speak about Continua and its core mission, it's to drive that type of plug and play where a blood pressure cuff to a network, say like AT&T or Verizon, or uh, our friends at Qualcomm Life looks like a mobile phone. It turns on like a mobile phone, and it takes data the way your voice and text and email take data on your carrier network today. Um, and I'm just delighted that in this room, one year later, there's probably 80% more people that know about Continue today than it did last year. And two today large wireless providers that are in our, um, uh, our trade show floor that are starting to think about scale, not vertically integrated, applications that we've been talking about, um, or deployment with respect to pilot size return on investments, but really looking at systems that have scale that can leverage this type of plug and play device enrollment and, and, and data enablement, right? Uh, and I think one year later, we're that much, that much down the line. But I think Chris has an actual solution that he wants right. to share, which I'm, I'm pretty excited to hear. So when we look at Part of what the problem is in scaling these solutions, obviously part of it's interoperability, but related with interoperability is business model. And what should the right business model be to scale these things? And, and what we're seeing from a business model perspective, and let me give you an analogy uh, that I oftentimes use when we look at the pharma industry. So if, if the drug company's business model was to invent a new technology, get it patented, then give the formula to doctors with the chemistry set and say, okay, doctors, make as much of this pill as you want to make. I don't think we'd have a multi-billion dollar pharmaceutical industry. What they've done is they've simplified it. They've taken and put it into a pill that's easy for a doctor to understand the features and benefits. Then there's wholesale distributors, and there's retail distributors and pharmacies. All the doctor does is he writes a script. That's it. He doesn't worry about anything else. It electronically goes to pharmacy, it's fulfilled, it can go to a PBM, it's fulfilled. So they've made the, the process of prescribing drugs so simple that all the doctor has to do is know about it, understand it, and write on a piece of paper or electronically, and it's done. Unfortunately, when it comes to a lot of these technologies, what we've done is we've made it very complicated for providers. They've got to know about different devices and different operabilities and different standards and different configurations. So if this patient has congestive heart failure and diabetes and is obese, so how many different devices do I need and which application do I use and how do they actually interoperate with one another and, and who actually pays for it and what's the business model? He can't just write a script. Until we turn this into something that is so simple that all the doctor does is said, okay, based upon your disease, I'm going to write you a script for this remote connected solution. And then somebody else does the fulfillment, somebody else does the monitoring, somebody else does the management, somebody else deals with all the equipment refurbishing and sanitization and all that sort of stuff. All of that happens magically because all the doctor had to do is know the disease, the condition, and what sort of script that he or she needed to write. So that's the world that we need to be going to. And in fact, that's the world we are going to. If you look at some of the companies that are here with AT&T and Verizon, Say, that is the business model they're going towards so that we can actually have this technology now that is just so simple, so interoperable, that all the doctor does is write a script and the problem is solved. So um, let me pick up on that one because that implies that the doctor has to select the specific remote patient monitoring device. Is that is that no, what he you're just envision? needs to select the solution that says for – so as Rob pointed out, 
there's no such thing as, as diabetes as a singular disease, right? There's type 1, type 2, there's people that have different. And so the doctor just needs to understand there's different diabetes configurations, just like there's different drugs for diabetes. And the right sort of drug depends on the type of diabetes you're dealing with. So for this, the right sort of technology solution is a function of the type of diabetic you are. All he needs to know is that there's four flavors, and for you, it's flavor one. I write the script, and it's fulfilled. Okay. We've added to their workload. So it's not the doctor saying, I want to know X about a patient and having so, a selection so process. It's actually knowing the difference between different types of sense. I'm understanding but, but the patient's But he already life. does know that, right? Yeah. He already does know the difference in the type of diabetes among his patients, right? He has to deal with, with those issues. So I'm not asking him to know anything new about his patient. Mm -hmm. We're just saying, just like you have different drugs to treat this patient, there's different sort of remote monitoring solutions or technologies to treat this patient. In the UK, the NHS has told doctors that they want doctors to write a script for an app when an app will replace an office visit. Right. That is the specific direction right. that they're given. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the same thing in this country that the NHS is trying to do in the UK. Yeah. So, yeah. Rob, I, yep. I think Rob. I, the, what Chris just described is actually very interesting, and, and a thought occurred to me that ties in very much with something Anthony said as well, and that the pharmacy model works because the pharmacy model is deconstructed, right? And Anthony talked about vertically integrated silos, but the pharmacy model is anything but. Somebody invents the drugs, somebody manufactures the drugs, somebody distributes the drugs. There's a, a, a competitive marketplace between a variety of pharmacies on your street corners where you can, you know, get the drugs through retail and they provide some value-added services, et cetera, et cetera. In the world of remote monitoring, M Health, Connected Health, whatever we want to call this, right, we haven't quite reached that point, and I think we haven't reached the realization that connected health nirvana is really about transient and persistent types of technology. Right? People, part of the value chain or part of the, the technology chain is going to be persistent, and that's the connectivity part. From the time someone's born to the time somebody dies in the whole connected health vision, there's a way for them to transmit their data to wherever it is it needs to go for them to, to transmit it to their friends and family and caregivers, to send it to their providers, et cetera. And that part of this chain needs to remain persistent. People need access to communications technology throughout it. But the other solutions are transient, right? I have episodes of illness. I have episodes where I'm overweight and I need to lose weight and I want to bring some technology to bear on that. And then there's other times of my life where I feel pretty good, I look pretty good, and, and I don't necessarily need as much technology. And what the interoperability we're talking about, the ability to, to go back to the original slide, to move this home, to enable this for consumers, really relies on some form of, in my mind, low-cost, persistent connectivity with the ability to layer on top of that during whatever episode we need to different types of technology to gather data, to transmit data, to evaluate data, to display data. And that's really what we're talking about here. And I think in Chris's model there's something very powerful in that that pharmacy model really is that deconstructed, whereas much of what we're seeing downstairs today are very constructed vertical types of, of devices where there's one entity providing the device, the connectivity, the monthly cost, they digest the data, they visualize the data, and they present it back to you. And I don't think we'll ever quite get to the scale you're talking about, an idea which I very much like, until we begin to deconstruct that and people make businesses out of the components. And most of that just occurred to me while I was sitting here, so I'm going to write some of that down. That's okay. That's okay. It was brilliant. So, but, so, so we'll have interoperable, con persistently connected, aware devices. I'd add uh, accessible and affordable. Um, go to Best Buy to buy them or Radio Shack, not have to go to a pharmacy um, or a hospital. Um, so w this has been very provider-centric conversation. What's in it for patients and consumers? Is that a football or is that that's a, a... Anybody, that's a, just a pitch. I mean, I think there's the the broad goal, right? People's health will improve. But fundamentally, I think this discussion is like every other discussion on the cost of health care, and that is to whom do the benefits of all this cost savings really accrue? And, and ultimately, we're talking about 
we're talking about using technology to fundamentally change lifestyles so that both individuals have a better quality of life, but societies as a whole are able to use their resources for things other than the provision of health care. Right? And, and I know that's a grand statement, and, but that's really fundamental to the M Health vision, I think. And that is that the benefits of this accrue to all of us. So, so if we deconstruct the costs of the system, right, 25% of the health care costs are associated with the primary infrastructure of health care, which are hospitals and clinics and things like that, all right? So we, we've created this entire infrastructure for 25% of the costs. 75% of the costs are associated with bad behaviors that we do in our homes all the time, not bad behaviors we do in the doctor's office, right, because we're always on good behavior when we see the doctor. So when we're not in that office, which is only a few times a year, we're actually doing all the things we're not supposed to be doing, and that generates 75% of the cost of health care. So nearly all the costs of health care are completely within our control as consumers if we would just change our lifestyle and our habits. So when we talk about human behavior change, human behavior change has three components. One component is there has to be a trigger that tells you there's something wrong. Another component says that there's got to be a capability you have to change that behavior so that the trigger changes. And the third component is there's got to be some sort of motivation that caused me to want to do it again and again and again. With these mobile devices, remote monitoring, we've got the triggers now. They're coming up. They're instantaneous. A lot of these are actually passive, that they can monitor your activity at home without you doing anything at all. Some of them, like a Fitbit or a fuel band or whatever, are monitoring stuff, sending it to the cloud. Right? So the triggers now are becoming really easy to get in digital form, which was not the case just three or four years ago. So the, really solving the trigger problem. The next problem is the capability problem. So how do we actually increase people's capability so that they actually believe they can change their behavior? So the different apps that we're using now are actually showing that we can actually use these tools with the triggers now to change our behaviors. And so when you look at something like Lose It, they've documented that the average person that downloads Lose It app and uses it loses 12 pounds. All right? So people can use that tool now to get better outcomes. Last night I'm at dinner with a, a woman who's got a son who's 32 years old, weighs over 300 pounds, and she says, my son wants to lose weight and he just can't lose weight. Well, so what has he done? Well, he's joined Weight Watchers. Okay, did he go to the meetings? No. Um, he's got a Fitbit. Does he use it? No. Um, she says, I've even offered to buy him a home, to give him all the money for a down payment on a home if he loses weight. So he's not motivated by money either. So, you know, we can only do so much with triggers and with capabilities. There still has to be that, that level of motivation, right? And people are motivated by different things, but we've got to figure out how to motivate people to actually do what they say they believe in which 60% of us apparently don't because 60% of us are overweight or obese. So, so we've got to figure out how to get that last part. But what you see going on now with some very innovative companies, I saw one just the other day, I, I met with their CEO, who's actually found a way to pay you for all of your activity. So you can actually get cash rewards that are generated by objective measures of your Fitbit or your fuel band or whatever else so that you can actually view now your physical activity as a source of economic value and return to you so that that can help people that are more motivated by that as opposed to people that aren't motivated by money as, and they're motivated by psychic benefit of being healthy. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that's what we need to do is figure out how do we get aligned with the way that we manage care and the cost of care, which is not the way we're aligned today. So, so I, I have to say in the little essay that we I wrote that we, was published by the hymns today. I titled it, Are We About to Make the Same Mistake Again? And I quoted that famous person, Pogo, and you just basically said it. We have met the enemy and he is us. And that's exactly what Chris is talking about. But here's, here's the follow-up question, and then we've just we've got a little bit of time. Let's get some questions from the audience. So if we are successful in that mission, which is the true mission, it's health, not health care, and we actually drive all of these self-generated problems out of the healthcare system. Is that what the healthcare system really wants? Does it want it? That's like the record labels deconstructing themselves voluntarily with digital music. And are we going to have resistance uh, from them? So, for, for yeah, I have an answer to that one too. But go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So, so here, here's the really short answer, and then I'll, I'll be quiet, and everybody else can talk. But 
Um, when we look at demographics around the world of, of health care delivery and populations needing health care services, what you find is that every health care system in the world okay, has a shortage of physicians and nurses. We used to solve our shortage problem in the United States by importing doctors from India and China and other places like that. That game is over. Why? Because their economies are growing so rapidly and becoming so wealthy that their doctors can stay in China, India, and make a lot of money. They don't need to come here anymore. So that source of, of Im immigrant talent that we used to fill our shortage with is gone. Those countries have their own shortage. So it's physically impossible for us to deliver health care the way we've done in the past to the people in the future, we just don't have enough bodies okay. and beds. So if we want to actually deliver health care to all the people who need it with the aging demographics that we've got, we have to deliver it in a different form. There's no other choice that we have. So all of this technology is not about you know, making doctors obsolete. It's about actually not producing more doctors, because we don't actually produce as many doctors as retire already. It's about actually getting more leverage in our system because you have more self-care. You know, what happened to the banking industry when they added ATMs? They didn't have to add as many branches. They didn't have to add as many tellers and whatnot. So you could actually have a more leveraged model when people provided their own care. So my argument is we don't need to think about unemploying physicians and nurses. We're going to keep as many as we've got employed, but we've got to provide health care to a lot more people than we have, and so the delivery system has to change. Yeah. Yeah, the, from a, a health system perspective, my health system at least um, understands and knows that, and, and is embracing change. I mean, five years ago I started talking about why can't we just have a hospital that consists of just an ED, an OR, and an ICU, and everything else will be done in some other setting. Well, we're not going to quite ever get there, but, but I think it's a model to strive for. Reimbursement is changing, the model is changing, we know we need to change, and we're, we're embracing that change and trying to figure out how to make that change and how to maintain people's health and still stay in business. Our business model is changing as well, um, but, but for all those reasons Chris was talking about and more, it's the right thing to do, and we're trying to figure out how to get there and, and not implode at the same time. I just want to add the third point that Chris was talking about, was, which is motivation. A show of hands, how many people play Angry Birds on their phones? A number of us, right? There is no one game that fits all of us. And what the game developers have figured out is that applications are perishables. They come and go out of vogue, just like our clothing and to some degree some our foods as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so when Hank says free the data, damn it, there's a really powerful business enabler there where you can enable application vendors, game developers, to build the right app for the right people. Right? And they are perishables. They're going to come and go. And your ability to enable that is actually quite powerful. And that's where I think we can try to gain some engagement scale and then drive motivation at a very personal level. Okay. Rob? I was going to say, it's probably time for questions, right? I just wanted to add one piece to key off something Chris said. If you follow that behavior model theory, right, a lot of, much of that work is done by someone named B.J. Fogg at Stanford University. And there was a key insight that he provided at a conference earlier this year that, that really drove it home for me. And BJ talks about this idea of technology-enabled behavior change as the intersection of motivation, ability, and a trigger. But the key insight from his learning and the work they've done at Stanford is that ability matters more than motivation. Right? And I'll say that again because I really think it's so powerful. Ability matters more than motivation. So to translate that, and I really had a chance to, to, to speak with BJ and understand this, his advice is very simple. If a trigger is not being successful, if people aren't changing their behavior, you are much better off making it easier for them to accomplish the behavior than to try to motivate them more. Right? And that plays to some of the ease of use and interoperability we've all been talking about. And I think the fact that there is, there is quantifiable evidence of that in work that they have done at the Persuasive Technology Lab is important to know. Make things easy and these triggers will be successful and behaviors will change. Yep, that's terrific. So um, I received a text message, not on this, but the old-fashioned form, <laughs> a real that text says message. that if we, um, since we started about 12 minutes late, we can go a little bit late if anyone's uh, still here. So I, we do want to get some questions. I will tell you, um, if the, 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 the discussion of, I call it sort of man versus machine, that Chris raised and why we need uh, better systems is of interest. Tomorrow morning super session where we have Vinod Kosla, the um, 
entrepreneur and venture capitalist, and Dr. Joe Kvedar um, on the uh, on the big stage. It will be an interesting conversation for you too. Uh, I hope you I hope you uh, join us for that. Okay, so questions. Oh, I can just introduce resist. yourself. I was just sitting there, it was in sure. my head. It was like, a, don't make a fool of yourself. And I said, you've got to ask him this. So. Well, her, first, who are you? So that just for everybody. My name is James Gaston. I'm uh, in clinical and business intelligence. I work for Hims Analytics. And I've worked in the provider side. I've worked in the payer side. And I've seen it all. And you're right. You talk about free the data. You're right. Data is extremely powerful. When I worked on the provider side, we couldn't get physicians in the same office to agree on how to measure, for example, weight, kilograms, or LBs. I just got my lab results from my annual physical, and it said on there my cholesterol level was measured using a specific test from this lab. It's not comparable to the same test from another lab. You know, that's ridiculous. It's not us that's holding the data hostage. It's the medical profession that's holding the data hostage. Why, what can you do, or why aren't more medical professionals working together to standardize data? I'll leave it at that. Thanks. I'm sure we can agree on the standard answer, which is, well, it's complicated. <laughs> um, beyond that, you I think you need a specialist for that one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the, I mean, the, I may have a slightly different perspective on that, but, but like every industry, you do have your entrenched interests. So, you know, the CAP, the College of Pathology, they're the ones that control all the lab results and everything, and, you know, they're, they're you're right. We, we have issues around just how do you standardize any one single test if you have it done at multiple locations. Are the results really the same and can you really have something with that? And again, that gets back to what I call the semantic interoperability. Are we talking the same language? Does something have the same meaning? So yeah, there's work that has to be done on, on all levels. But I would also argue that at least on the clinical side, if you give the clinician the data, they could put it into perspective. They'll understand what to do with it. If we want to give it to the individual, is it going to make sense to them? And we need to make sure that it, that it does. And I'll also just add one other comment, which doesn't really address the question, but you know, CMS has been very kind to us, those of us that are deep into the bowels of meaningful use, stage three. They gave us a, a pre-release party on stage three, meaningful use. And one of the, the issues they want feedback on is interoperability of medical devices. So we know on the provider side it's coming, um, that, that CMS, ONC, HHS realizes that how we collect data is important and what we do with it is important. And, and with you know, being with, with your insights from HIMSS analytics, you may have some other advice that we, we could use in the argument as well. So. I think... Um, I'll use your cholesterol test as, or your test as an example, right? And my background is in analytical chemistry, so I'm going to pretend I'm uniquely qualified to talk about this, right? <laughs> uh, Hank said something very interesting, and it plays into the whole interoperability discussion, and that is if lab results for a specific example are the end result of a very well-regulated and uniform process, then the output is very dependent on the inputs. So to answer your question, what that piece of paper is saying without saying it is that, well, of course the results are comparable to any other lab who does the same test, but since we have no idea how they might draw your blood sample or what instructions they gave you on what to eat or not to eat the night before, we can't guarantee you'll get the same output because we can't guarantee the same inputs. And that ultimately gets to this idea of not just semantic operability, but when we talk about data portability and the movement of data, getting a blood pressure, for example, or a cholesterol reading from a device is useful. Getting some context of that reading is much more useful, right? So when you look at any of the, the standard vocabularies that we would use to tag this data, and we're struggling with this on ourselves right now because they really don't address this M Health remote monitoring space, I need to know not just that I'm getting a blood pressure from you, but that blood pressure was derived from a home monitor, preferably the type of monitor, and preferably a number of other things, whether or not you've been trained in its use, whether or not your data is usually consistent, whether or not this data makes sense with your previous data to see if it was the cuff on your arm or on your friend's arm who put it on when he was over there, you know, watching a football game or something. 
Exactly. The, the context of the data is just as important, and that is certainly an area that we need to get to. So to answer your question, we do it because so much of the process is out of our control, and as, as healthcare providers, we don't like to be out of control. And so we just warn you that you can't compare this because we can't guarantee we're going to get the same inputs to compare the outputs. So next question. Actually, it's not a, as much a question as, uh, and I, I'm a nurse, so I, I guess I would say I think instead of freeing the data, we need to think about freeing the patients and the people who are patients sometimes, but mostly their employees or family members who have illnesses. And, and I say that actually from, um, you know, I think that we would have enough doctors and nurses. We'd probably have too many doctors and nurses in the world if we would think about this technology era as one in which we can provide information to people so that they can try to do the right thing. I don't think that as many people have what we are, you know, in the clinical setting calling behavior problems as we say have behavior problems. I think we are the ones with the behavior problems because we have not thought of the solution yet to enable them to do the right thing. An example I would give you is just something as basic as a diabetic or someone on a weight management program who goes on to a resort like this, needs to eat their food, the proper food, has anybody given them a device uh, that they can scan that menu and say, these are the best choices for you on the menu. So we already have the calories on a lot of the menus, but we don't have anything to give that person the ability to make the right choices. They shouldn't have to go to a doctor to get that information or a nurse. So I think that's one thing we need to keep in mind. And the other thing I think as we're moving forward with technology and healthcare and operability, interoperability, um, I think we need to consider that, um, you know, what lessons can we learn from, you mentioned pharma, but specialty pharma. I have a friend who's got cancer, got diabetes, and, and this is how she describes what goes on for her. Um, she knows she has to take the medicines. She generally wants to live, except she has some days where she probably would rather not deal with her diseases. But she gets calls every month from the specialty pharmaceutical company and talk about behavior modification. She says, I know all they want to do is know if I'm still alive before they ship the drug. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. When she said that, uh, it made me really think. I think there is a lot of truth in what the patients tell us, and I think we need to um, make time to hear what the patients have to say, maybe have them. L Lego is a good example. They, they don't do this with medicine, but they have a good practice where they use, they just went out to the public and said, you know, how do, what do you want, you know, what do you want? And build this or that. Show us what you want, what you do with Legos. Why don't we ask the patients, you know, the technology firms, ask the patients more, then consult the physicians and the nurses. But get the patients input first, because I think you'll get a lot farther. One last example. So at a diabetes technology conference um, about a year ago, patients on the whole panel, they were all young, mostly young, they kept saying, you know, so they're at risk. What, what happens, they said, is I get used to this mobile device and the tune, and I need to t have a different tune, but you haven't given me enough tunes, because if I hear the same tune all the time, I don't pay attention. I, it just, you know, it's kind of background noise. So it's something as simple as that, just give them a different tune, give them more tunes. And it's just very simple, I think, sometimes, and we try to make it really complicated because medicine is complicated. But if we can take a step back and always just remember, talk to the patient, make it, you know, that they will help you make it really simple, and then, get, then they can go for get the, uh, to get the clinical advice to inform them beyond that. So I, I just, as a nurse, I just want to. Well, thank you. I think those, are a, set of, those are a set of principles that we probably would all agree yeah. with. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, we have another question. Uh, my name is Aldo. I'm a pediatric gastroenterologist in, uh, from Texas. Um, my first is a comment. You know, talked about costs um, with the CHF program specifically. And I think once um, the reimbursement model changes, so instead of, you know, we're, we reimburse for outcomes instead of um, fee for service, I think that would change. I'm not, I'm not sure if that's entirely true or not. My second thing is um, all the data that we're getting as an outpatient looks like we're trying to take the inpatient setting. I, I guess the beauty of the inpatient setting is you're, you can uh, establish trends with, with labs and vitals and everything. And so with all these devices, we're getting all this data. We're basically adapting the inpatient setting to the outpatient, you know, establishing trends. Um, so who's responsible for the in, inpatient? You have a nurse. You have physicians that are on 24-7. Who's responsible for the outpatient setting when you got a glucose of 50 or somebody with high blood pressure and strokes out and, and you, somebody didn't catch it? 
or you know who's who's monitoring? Because I guess you need somebody monitoring those things all the time. So, so let, let me let me just say um, just for everyone here, um, thanks. We're, we're two or three minutes over, and I realize we started late, but a lot of people have to leave because they're on schedule. So let's make this the last question. But for any other questions, I hope panelists are able to stay around for a little bit, and we can get others on a private basis. Okay. So um, thank you, Bill. So Rob. The courts haven't litigated this. The answer is we don't know yet, right? It, it will happen. Somebody will be dragged into court because somebody didn't look at something that they think they do, and the judges and the juries will decide, and eventually the case law will settle itself around some kind of standard of care, and we'll all move on. Um, until then, as an unknown, it's, it's a fear that all providers have. It's a fear that our system has, and it's something I hear internally all the time. But I think the fundamental answer was articulated best by the previous questioner, right? Ultimately, it's the patient's responsibility, right? And Today, we sort of hedge that bet. In our particular programs, when a patient is signed up for any type of remote monitoring, they're presented with essentially a set of terms and conditions, which is explained to them in, in very clear language, but it basically says this is not replacing your existing care, and by the way, nobody is going to look at this 24 hours a day, because if you were that sick, remote monitoring probably would not be an appropriate technology to deploy. And so as we're looking at lifestyle things and hypertension and blood pressure and the big expensive diseases, there's almost nothing, with the exception of some diabetic incidents, that we're going to tell minute by minute um, that's really going to affect somebody's life. So I think the answer is we don't know yet. We need some providers who are willing to take the risk and let the law settle itself. But ultimately, by involving patients, by asking patients, by making patients equal participants in their care, I have every belief deep down that they will step up and surprise the hell out of us out of how much responsibility they're willing to take and how far they are willing to go to learn and understand the numbers that they are really really deriving from themselves and that for their particular conditions they can be absolutely equal participants and, and I'll put it to you this way since everybody likes anecdotes, we have a video up on our website of an 83-year-old woman who was part of our congestive heart failure program, and she was interviewed by a local CBS affiliate in Boston, and she ended the interview this way. She said, you know, sometimes I have to be my own doctor because nobody else has been with this body for 83 years like I have. Yeah, well, I think um, that's, that's actually true. It is our responsibility initially, right? So... Um, I think this has been a great panel. I hope that this discussion has been a little bit helpful for all of you and maybe a lot helpful for some of you. And uh, so uh, join me in thanking the, the panel for making the time available.